Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Kamal Hassan, and I am a 65-year-old Palestinian refugee still. First of all, on behalf of the Palestinian people, I want to thank you and many Israeli brave, such as yourself, Miko Pellet, Max Blumenthal, and others, Alison Weir. My question to you is, why do you do this for the Palestinian people and peace? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a good question, not because I'm, I'm so interested why I'm doing it. Of course, we all ask these questions because we want to enlarge the number of Israeli Jews who are doing what we are doing. And I think that's why this analysis is important. You're trying to understand the transformation you yourself undergo so to see whether you can really create a more massive movement of people who come from a similar background and may uh, go in the same uh, direction. And of course, the, the difficult thing of applying a personal story into political activism is that of course, each human story of transformation is different from another. But there are some comments common issues, and uh, I always remind myself the fact that there are, and there are even today, young Israeli Jews who are beginning in various degrees of conviction to feel the same things that I feel, means that despite of years, decades of fabrication, of indoctrination, uh, of dehumanization, Despite of all of that, there is always a group of people who are not blind. They can see the ruins of the Palestinian village. They can see with their eyes the atrocities committed against the Palestinians today. They can hear with their ears the cries of Palestinian children when Israeli airplanes attack them. And they can understand that they have at least the ability to talk if not to act on behalf of the people who are victims of their own state. Uh, this is not common only to us. I think it's common to many other people. But the, so that's one, question, one answer to, to your question. But the second one is really, I think, most people like myself who come from the comfort zone, and I think that was also true about Rachel. People who come from a certain privileged position in society, I think feel obliged if they are, if they have a modicum of decency in them, feel obliged to do it. It's not a matter of why they are doing it. They, they really reach a mature point where they don't understand why others are not doing it. They don't ask themselves why they are doing it. And my feeling when I visit Israel, when I'm there, and I see my own generation, my children's generation, I really don't understand why we are so few uh, inside uh, Israel. And uh, especially when the price we will pay, uh, especially as Israeli Jews, does not compare to the price the Palestinians are paying. And I think this all gives strength to, for us to do it, but we are doing it for our humanity, we don't expect any reward, and we're doing it to ourselves, uh, for ourselves, and for anyone else we regard as, as our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark. Hi. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you actually to follow up a bit on what you just started to talk about now in the last answer. You know I'm not one of these people who, uh, who says we don't have the right to tell the Israelis or the Palestinians what to do, that we bear a responsibility as citizens of the world. And um, if you, I mean, if you talk to the South Africans, they, they will all say we could not have done it, even with our with the resistance movements that we had, which are more robust and 
than what you have in Israel and Palestine today. Uh, we, we couldn't have done it without the pressure of the outside world. That's what brought down the regime. Um, so we have to do this. But having said that, what, what do you see going on in Israel today? Can you maybe share a bit from your own experience um, about what that is? And, and how, can we best, um, how can we best support that? And I'm talking about Israel. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. And thank you for bringing uh, to the light uh, uh, the pressure from the outside. Because I think the two are, are connected. Um, the, the, galvanized, the galvanized kind of public opinion uh, behind the Palestine cause in this country, in the world at large, is the only, probably the only good news we have in the last 10 or 15 years. The, the uh, growing effectiveness, popularity, uh, and attractiveness of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement is really something that, compared to everything else that goes on in Palestine, is really uh, 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 inspirational and gives you hope for the future. And, but I think we all are aware that this is not enough. That the pressure from the outside without the unity of the Palestinian movement from the inside, its clear definition of liberation, and of course, the chances of any movement of change from the inside of the Israeli Jewish society. Without these three components, it would be very difficult to envisage a different reality uh, on Palestine, in, in Palestine. But I do think that the fact that the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement is so successful shows us that at least from the outside, there is now not only a change in public opinion views on Palestine. There is now a powerful actor on the ground in Israel and Palestine that was not there before. The only international actors who were effective between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean were governments, international agencies. For the first time, we have representatives of the civil society who are there and even if they are denied entry by Israel, they are still there. Meaning, you cannot, as Israel, do what you want and the world doesn't know. This was possible. You cannot claim or tell people that nothing wrong is happening to the Palestinians. These days are over. This is transparent. This is fully exposed. Now, that by itself, I know, any, uh, is not bringing change. Any one of us who, who experienced talking to young Palestinians in the West Bank, in, in the Galilee, in Gaza, and, and talked to them and told them enthusiastically about the, uh, uh, the BDS as a new movement, knows how they shrug their shoulders and say, so what? We, last year was worse than the year before, so these news that you bring us do not plant any hope in our hearts and minds. And of course, you can understand that they want to see tangible results on the ground, but they will see them. I keep telling them. You cannot underrate this dramatic change in public opinion. It's a long process, I agree. And the last thing you want to ask people under oppression is to hold on, because it's very difficult to ask people who are suffering from the brutal uh, oppressive machinery of Israel to hold on, to say, believe us, we are now changing the public opinion in the world and it will have an impact. And I really believe in it. On the same time, I'm not blind to the level of destruction. And in fact, as in the case of South Africa, when the pressure from the outside becomes effective, the ruler becomes more lethal, more brutal. That's the unfortunate coincidence of history we have to tackle, understand, but nonetheless not lose heart. Now, Mark, your question about what goes in Israel, what goes on in Israel in this respect, is very relevant. I think there are two processes that take place in Israel, and both of them are an inevitable uh, consequence of the settler colonial nature of the whole Zionist project. 
One thing that happens is the total disappearance, but this is really total, total disappearance of something that could be called liberal Zionism. This idea that you can be an enlightened occupier, an enlightened ethnic cleanser, an enlightened uh, uh, colonizer, even the Israelis themselves find it a bit ridiculous. So this whole notion that I, I'm still a Zionist, but uh, I'm more liberal than the usual Zionist, I'm kind of a diet Zionist, um, is not working. <coughs> In fact, I tell everyone, if you know any liberal Zionists, uh, keep them alive. They are an extinct uh, species. <laughs> and one day, uh, people would want to know how does it look? How does a person who can square circles look like? <coughs> they disappear. And when they disappear, it doesn't mean always good news. Because in their stead, what you have is, if you want, an unashamedly Zionist ideology prevailing, what I call neo-Zionism. That's even a worse version of Zionism than it used to be. If you see, if you look at it from the perspective of its victims, the Palestinians, although I think also Jews are victims of Zionism, not just Palestinians. And uh, this is this kind of historical moment where you have to be very brave because they will be even, unfortunately, they will be more brutal. They will be even less uh, sensitive about human rights and civil rights, if, if that is even possible. I think they will target people like me and you much more than ever they did before, not just Palestinians. This is now an inevitable historical process, but it is also a positive development. It's, it's, it's horrendous to say this, but it is. When, when you expose an evil reality for what it is, you can then galvanize people against it. If all the time people cannot see what's happening in Israel, it's very difficult to galvanize humanity against it. So that's one process. The process of the disappearance of the liberal game of Zionism. The positive process is that there is a small growing nucleus of young people who understand that this is the junction in apartheid, Israel, or a democratic free Palestine. They know it. They know it. Unlike my generation, because they, they, they uh, second generation or third generation of settlers, they have no shame of saying this is their homeland. They feel it's their homeland as much as it is the homeland of the Palestinians. And actually, from that perspective, it's much easier for them to say, we don't want to live in an apartheid state, even if that apartheid state gives us privileges. And we've seen a similar kind of impulse among young South Africans, young Americans who went to the South to fight for civil rights in the 1960s. This is not, we shouldn't be that desperate about humanity if we find some young people who say oppression is something I'm going to fight against, even if my own state is the oppressed. We should hope this was a phenomenon that happened in history, and there's no reason to believe to think they won't reappear. And I can see the buds of it within the Israeli Jewish society. And, and we are familiar with some of these NGOs, and they are growing. They are growing. One of the biggest secrets in Israel is, is how many people refuse to go to the army. The numbers are staggering. And the Israelis are not talking about it because they don't want to admit it. And the numbers, unfortunately, of suicide is very high in Israel, among Israeli. Uh, soldiers. It's not true that you can take young people and turn them into butchers and massacres uh, uh, in Gaza and think that doesn't do anything to them. It's not true. It's, uh, they also uh, uh, understand, if not immediately, a bit later, that they were part of a criminal uh, uh, project. So this is another uh, phenomenon. But I think there is a dialectical connection. If we will empower and enhance the pressure from the outside. These groups will be empowered from the inside, and uh, the Palestinians have their own agency to be united, tell us exactly their vision of the future, which is not very clear, so that uh, we can really start the long and painful, it will be a long and painful journey for restitution and reconciliation.
campaign for Israel has been the United States support. Uh, is there, I, I get a feeling that there might be a great awakening coming when American people wake up and say, let's don't do it anymore. I agree. I, I think that exactly, that this is what I was talking about. I think we are at this twilight zone between one period of politics and another period or another era of politics. And with the old era of politics would also go the uh, acceptance by an American taxpayer uh, idea that giving money to Israel at the expense of spending that money on issues in the United States is a reasonable, logical thing to do. This is only one of many, if you want, logical explanation that would be exposed as illogical, immoral, and unacceptable. And I, I really think in that respect, Israel and Zionism, and it's not the only uh, uh, phenomenon in the world today, represent something that cannot be shielded anymore in moral terms, in terms of justice. And uh, of course, you can assume that most politicians and most people who deal with the economy would say to you or laugh at you if you want to inject morality into politics and economy. But every, every human period we know in history, this comes back to haunt them when they are going too far. And this particular group of humanity has gone too far with its cynicism in politics, economy, and social issues. And Israel is one of the places that epitomizes this cynicism. And therefore, I think a change there is an indicator of a change uh, elsewhere. Hi, uh, my name is Amjad Faor. I'm faculty here on campus. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, I just had a question, um, really should be a very straightforward question, but I have a feeling the answer won't be okay. as straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious if you could, as a very careful observer uh, of the region, um, let us know what you think might be the anchors or, well, the uh, levers uh, of political, let's say, civic, popular, and political leverage uh, within the occupied territories available to Palestinians under whatever um, mechanisms of control, uh, whether it's the PA, Hamas, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. uh, Gaza, the West Bank, are there uh, political, do they have their sources of political leverage, civic leverage, <coughs> popular leverage? Uh, if there are, what might those be? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think part of it I, I hinted to, but uh, we can say it even more, more, more clearly. Um, before you, you, you identify leverages, before you identify the kind of factors that have the power to transform reality, you have to identify the obstacles. And there's no doubt that some, not some, all the bodies today that claim to represent the Palestinians are such obstacles. Whether it's the Hamas government in Gaza, whether it is the Palestinian members of Knesset in Israel, or whether it is the PA. These are all representative bodies that belong to a period in which you thought that the struggle for Palestine could be pushed as an anti-colonial struggle, not the struggle against settler colonialism, or the other side of that coin, by totally submitting to a kind of Pax Americana and hope that Israel would be satisfied with only 80% of Palestine. And, and, and I think this is clearly not working. Both of them are not working. So I think before we know what the leverage are, we have to understand what stands in the way. I think we can begin to see the leverage that you're talking about. One of them is very interesting. It's, it's, uh, if, you, if you think about it, the greatest success, one of the greatest successes of the Zionist movement was fragmenting the Palestinian into five different groups. And each group had its own agenda. And, and it was quite easy in many ways to pit one group against the other because of this usually physical separation, not just the ideological separation. The age of Facebook and uh, internet allows the younger generation to converse freely and openly 
beyond these boundaries. So young Palestinians in Haifa, and the young Palestinians in, in Hedwe, and the young Palestinians in Olympia can discuss the present and the future in a way that their uh, parents thought was impossible for physical reasons, if not for other reasons. And, and I think this is something that needs time to mature. And of course, there's always the danger uh, if it will only remain as a cyber state mm -hmm. activism. We, we know it from the Arab Spring, that you have to be very careful to think that if you uh, have good ideas and you talk about them, uh, uh, even in kind of an anarchist way, and say, I don't need any tools, I don't need any organizations, I don't need any unions, that by itself creates revolutions. It's like trying to take water with your hands from one place to the other because you hate bottles. Uh, there's no way, unfortunately, to transform water from one place to the other without some sort of a container. And, and, and I think this is something we, we are talking with young people in Palestine when we share with them the ideas of a democratic state, of a free Palestine, of a decolonized Palestine. We talk about the need of unions, <coughs> of parties, of organization, and it's not easy because there is a healthy disdain for all these organizations because of what they reflect. But they are only vehicles. They are not the issue itself. And these are the leverage, I think. These are the ones, and we can see them uh, starting in new trade unions that have just appeared in the West Bank, uh, the, demo, the one democratic state movement that emerged all over Palestine. Uh, you can begin to see this. Uh, it's such small buds and early buds uh, that it's too early to say how successful they are and how significant they are, but definitely they begin to, you know, to grow. Yeah. My name is Bethany Widener. Hi. Uh, I hope some other women come up here too. I have a question because <clears throat> we just see the news here about uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party and the recent accusations against members uh, of anti-Semitism and why they seem to have been so receptive to those accusations. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the accusations are that kind of moment where, as an activist, you want to be in it and you don't want to be in it. You don't want to be ignored. And when you're doing good things, you are being not ignored and attacked. And that's not a pleasant position to be in. I think that uh, the, the accusation of anti-Semitism towards Jeremy Corbyn uh, in person and the Labour Party in Britain in particular are exactly uh, an indication that we are moving in certain parts of the world to a different political era. He is the leader of the main opposition in Britain. This is not an under, should not underestimate the importance of this position. It's the first time we have a senior member of the political elite who is unashamedly and unconditionally committed to the cause of Palestine. Uh, if someone would have told you this 10 years ago, you would have thought that they were insane or had too much to drink. <laughs> and the Israelis and their friends are aware of it. This is a significant a very significant development. So they use all the ammunition, and they will do far worse things than what they're doing now uh, by accusing uh, uh, Corbyn of anti-Semitism or the Labour Party of anti-Semitism. Anti this is their moment of the final struggle. And as, I, as I said, learning from the case of South Africa, the white regime in South Africa was using the most lethal weapons the moment it began, be, began to be shaky and losing its uh, uh, kind of traditional uh, support groups and, and power bases. So I think that's the reason, and we should not be, uh, Jeremy is a very good friend of mine, and I can tell you on his behalf, he is not afraid of these accusations, he has no doubts about about them, uh, and, and I don't think that they will work. I really don't think they will work. I think they will backfire. They will backfire because that is not the issue. The issue is. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
that, listen, this is, this is a, an evolution, I said. It's not a revolution. It's an evolution. Give some people time to adjust. Uh, people are sometimes in the Labour Party, some, some of them may be afraid. Some of them react in a bad way. Some of them react in a better way. I, I would not jump to, to conclusions. I think that uh, it's, it's a very courageous, it's a very courageous act of cleansing to be able to say to yourself, I have the antidote against this virus, but it's not an easy one. It's not an easy one. Uh, Israel can be very intimidating. Its friends can use bribery. They can use inducement. Politicians usually think about the next election, uh, so they have a leverage against them, as they have in this country. But we are beginning to see the cracks in the wall. I would, instead of you being impressed by the fact that some Labour members are being sacked, you should be impressed by the fact that for Israel, the members of the Labour Party in Britain are the greatest danger. That's what is important here. And this seems that they are losing the bet. This is what is important here. The fact that, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Not everybody would be as courageous as a second person. Not everybody will be. And we'll have a lot of U-turns and retractions and, and things we wouldn't like. But I, I must say, from an historical perspective, the things I see here in, in the academia, the, see, the things I see in the Labour Party in Britain, in, in Spain, in, in uh, Greece, in Portugal, things are happening that I think that those of us who have been long enough in this struggle know that we have dreamed of these moments. But we never eluded ourselves that these would be happy moments, easy moments, or picnics. These are struggles. These are struggles, yeah, yeah. If you want to free Palestine, you have to fight for it. It won't happen just by itself. So these are struggles, and everybody has their own domain and their own area where they have to be steadfast, courageous, and ex expect a very vicious counterattack. And it will come, and it's already come. Salam, shalom. Shalom, salam. Um, you have a little more hair, but we feel the burn. Um, I guess my question is, um, looking into a crystal ball, and this is not an easy uh, uh, answer, I think, to articulate, looking into the crystal ball, uh, within a lifespan that may impact us, so the next 10 or 15 years, uh, in, from your vantage point um, and that of your peers, what do you see as perhaps the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, or the most likely scenario in the next 10, 15 years or so? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, I usually don't deal with it. I think it's, uh, it's very uh, counterproductive for uh, activists to try and predict the future. Uh, it can affect the level of their commitment and their energy that they're invested. I always say activists should say to themselves, not how did I impact reality, but did I do enough to try and impact it today? Uh, so I think that in, in that respect, uh, I'm not dealing too much with worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, but I will respect your question. I think it's, it, it, it deserves an answer. Um, I think that I described tonight certain positive processes, and I described a lot of counter-negative processes. So the best case scenario is for these good processes to increase, to see more support from the outside to Palestine, to see the anti-Zionist movement in Israel growing, to see the Palestinian national movement be more united and has a more clear agency about its own fate and the future. This would be, for me, the best case scenario. And, that, and I think that if this scenario would happen, I really strongly believe it will have a very positive impact on other places in the Middle East. I, I strongly, strongly believe in it. So the worst case scenario is, of course, that the counter-Israeli the counter reaction 
to these successful achievements is going to be very brutal and much more prolonged than I predict. That's my fear. So this for me is the worst case uh, uh, scenario. But you know, I, I talked with leaders of the ANC and, and they always remind us that just a few weeks before the uh, Berlin Wall collapsed, they were, most of them were hiding uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, in nearby countries, Namibia and, and, and other countries. And they were, at, they were very pessimist about the future, very, very pessimist. And uh, one of them, not Mandela, Mandela was, was in jail, of course. One of them had uh, a small radio. And they heard in the radio the BBC World Service, that the Berlin Wall collapsed, and so on. And one of them said, this is it. Something is going to change. And they thought he was you know, too many days in the jungle and uh, <laughs> has made him a bit uh, lose, losing touch with reality. And he said, you don't understand. Without the Berlin Wall, the United States has no reason not to join the sanctioned regime on South Africa. And this would change the whole balance of our struggle. So sometimes you have to take into account the worst case and best case scenarios that you don't have total control on events that can have a positive impact uh, on your own situation. And that's why activism has not to deal so much with prediction as much more in, uh, on impact, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the last, the last two, two, yeah. Yeah, yeah, by all means, yeah, the last two questions together. Okay, yes, please. Hi, thank Hi. you very much. I'm an Arab European American, mm -hmm. and um, what is happening now with our political, we're sitting in horror, not so much at the rhetoric that Trump is spewing or all the other uh, candidates, um, but so much more so at the reaction of neighbors, relatives, and things that we never dreamt that people that knew us and loved us and cared about us would do. And I'm just wondering about the contrast about, like, for example, what we saw from the nationalists after the murder of the, of the young man by the soldier and the support that came out for the soldier and for his actions. And I'm just wondering, is it that this always was, that it existed, or is there something actually happening there far more evil, maybe it's the beginning of something. I'm just wondering what your analysis is. Okay, thank you. You said two questions? Thank you. Um, my question is, how significant would it be to have a Jewish president of the United States to, as far as Israel is concerned, and how might that advance the Palestinian situation. Okay, thank you. Um, let me uh, start with the first uh, issue. As always uh, uh, in politics, uh, you have more than one way to understand an event. The event, for example, that you, you pointed to, which was a demonstration in Tel Aviv in support of the soldier who murdered the, 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 the wounded, unarmed Palestinian, could be seen as a total failure of the organizers. They expected hundreds of thousands of people to come, and the only people who came were supporters of, uh, we call them the Kahana supporters, so the very extreme right-wing supporters. It was, in fact, they failed to convince even mainstream Israeli artists and politicians to join them. So the question is, how do you analyze it? it, it because this is an, uh, this is a very important junction that I'm talking about. On the one hand, as I said tonight, for me, an intransigent, brutal, apartheid, cruel Israel is the ine inevitable result of the logics that propel settler colonialist projects, elimination, dehumanization, and as long as Zionist ideology is the ideolo ideology of Israel, uh, these, unfortunately, atrocities would continue. On the other hand, you have to ask yourself, in 2016, 
Are all the Israeli Jews blind to what their government is doing, how they are being seen in the world? And the answer is no. I think most of them are confused. So they don't go to that demonstration, not because they support the Palestinians. They're not yet there. They're not there yet. But they don't feel totally comfortable to go and support the soldier in public. And that's very interesting. It shows you that they still don't have an alternative plan to stick to. And one of the reasons is, I think, that the Palestinians who have to lead the way, as the African National Congress led the way, they have to lead the way, they have to tell these Jewish settlers what is their place in the future free Palestine. Now, why didn't we have this conversation before? Because the Palestinian leadership said there's no problem, there's a two-state solution. So Israelis don't have to think about anything, they just have to decide whether they would allow us to have one Bantu stand in the West Bank and one Bantu stand in the Gaza Strip. And in this respect, there's no difference between the Hamas and Fatah. They are in the same uh, conundrum. So I think to, to, to get these Israelis to, to talk about a different future, where they already feel uncomfortable with the present itself, you need to give them an alternative. And that's why I do believe that the democratic state movement is the beginning of such, of such an idea. So yes, the cruelty, the inhumanity is an inevitable result of the settler colonial nature of Israel. But that doesn't mean that we should lose hope that even settlers, you know, uh, cannot change. When apartheid failed in South Africa, the vast majority of whites were still very racist. Nowadays, you go the days, you, you visit South Africa, almost every second white person in South Africa tells you, oh, I used to go to rallies against uh, the apartheid. And you know that they're lying. You know that they're lying. Say, oh, I was always against it. And you say to themselves, if you, so many of you were against it, how did it succeed for so many years? And I think the same will happen to Zionists. I, I, I can assure you, this is not the best case scenario. This is something that will happen. They will say, oh, we were always thinking that the idea of a Jewish state was not a good idea, democracy is what we wanted, and so on. I'm, I'm very hopeful about uh, this uh, thing. I'm so hopeful that I forgot your question. <laughs> The Jewish president of the United States. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I got it, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I talked about uh, certain things that would have to disappear if we are really going to enter a new era of politics. And for me, a new era of politics would, one of the major indicators would be a, a drastic fundamental change the reality in Israel and Palestine. And one of the other indicators is a total divorce between Judaism and Zionism. So in fact, I would put it this way. If the Jewishness of an American president has any impact on Israel and Palestine, it means we're still in the old era. Yeah. And nothing is going to change. If the fact that the American president is Jewish or not has nothing to do with the developments in the relationship between Palestinians who live in Palestine and those who were expelled from Palestine and the Jews who live there today, then we are in a new era. So I think that divorcing Zionism from Judaism is as important as fighting for the rights of the Palestinians, which is, I think, what we are all doing here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for, for a brilliant lecture, inspirational for his groundbreaking historical analysis, the importance of foregrounding settler colonialism and the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and understanding the foundation of the Israeli state. And his work has been so critical in counteracting the imposed historical silences. As he mentioned, Palestinians would not be able to write the kind of history that he's written. And the denials that have riddled the dominant narrative in this struggle for justice. 
And it also points us towards what these just solutions and these important conversations are that need to happen. And I especially love the reference to Palestine, whether we're looking at trade unionists in Latin America or elsewhere wearing Palestinian flags as a worldwide symbol of hope for humanity against hypocrisy and double talk, something that all of us are really yearning for here. So it's been an honor to have you in Olympia to inaugurate the Rachel Corey Memorial Lecture. And those of us who knew Rachel here as a student, um, in our community, as an activist, as a very eloquent writer, as a sister and a daughter, <coughs> Um, have been really inspired by Rachel's example as well and her courage in standing with the Palestinians. And many of us faculty here were sharing stories about Rachel recently and saying how when we traveled to Egypt, when we traveled to Spain, when we traveled to Latin America, we found in the wake of Rachel's killing, people were so welcoming to us being from Evergreen because they were so inspired by Rachel's story and by her sacrifice, by her spirit of resistance. And um, for those of us who, who've read her writing and knew her for her joy, for her joy for life. And I especially want to thank Rachel's parents, Cindy and Craig Corey. They've been tirelessly working here in this community internationally through the Rachel Corey Foundation to really further Rachel's work. And so thanks again to <laughs>